So let's take some modern tech and merge them with some 70s. So here we are with the two screens and the multiplexer so we can send different pictures on different displays on different screens and if you're aware if you watched the last video I'll put a link up just above now I have some real problems on power up when I power it up these are blank and I have to do a soft reset using the Arduino Nano's uh, reset button there until I can get both screens showing a user called Neil suggested putting some bypass caps um, decoupling capacitors which basically just like little act as little reservoirs for uh, chips so I put one across the positive and negative of the actual mucks that didn't work and I must admit when I already suggested I thought yeah that'll work that, that sounds really good I mean I, I built systems oh, many years ago when every every TTL chip had a little like had a 10 nanofarad capacitor on every sort of power rail and you put them really as close as you can so I put I put the capacitor across there. Um, I tried to turn narrow nanofarad. I even tried a little bit higher than that as well, uh, building up so I could make any difference, but it didn't. And then I thought, okay, let's go all out. So I put um, the decoupling bypass capacitor there across the power supply. So each of these displays, what else did I do? Then I did a delayed software. I, I delayed the software on the nano so that it actually wasn't talking to this and it took for about a second or two. Really a massive amount of time in computer terms. A huge amount of time. And I also connected up the reset to the Nano's reset. I did everything and I tried various options on this and having the reset on, connected, and having it connected, and the resistors on, the resistors not on. Tried all these combinations and the same fault happened like I showed in the end of the last video where you, when, it, when you power it up, these just never come, and li come to life right away. I have to software reset. Now, if this chip isn't there, they always come to life right away. I've never had a problem with it. My project's using these screens. So something to do with this, but I can't figure out why. So I also said I'd do another solution for it, which I am doing. So this is going, because I really want this to work and to work from power up, not just for a few soft resets. That's not much good for anybody. So I've got, I'd ordered these some time ago for a different project. Um, I think I had some in Portsmouth as well for when I used to build a lot of little basic computer boards. Um, these are some 7.4 series logic chips. Oh, if I could actually get the... I can never get these things out. Let's see if I can push that out. Oh, no, I'll just break my pointing device or my... And I'm showing the age of this pencil now. This is Ben 10, which is... That is so 10 years ago or something, isn't it? Uh, let me just get something to get that green tab out before it pulls my nail out when I try. Okay, I did a jump cut there because I was gone for some minutes. My little set of tools for, you know, little... Little screwdrivers, little side cutters, snipes. One of my children was playing with them the other day and has gone and put them somewhere and I can't just find them for now. So I've grabbed this big screwdriver which should do the trick. I've just got to wedge it in there and pull off the end stop. There we go. So I bought about 10 of these. It's five in each row, so some, some somewhere else. And it's a 74. Remember the number? I think it's 139, isn't it? See if I can just see what that is in the uh, light. Yeah, 74139. And that's basically a 2 to 4 decoder. Now, it's not easy to explain what a decoder, unless you know what a, decoder, a 2 to 4 decoder is. It's not easy to explain um, just here. So, I'm going to go to a graphic on screen. So, a 74139 is what they call a demultiplexer. All it means is from a, a binary number that you put into it, it will select one of the options that that could be. To make that a little bit simpler to explain, so we have two numbers here coming in on A0, A1 here. These are our binary digits coming in, just two binary digits. And with two binary digits, you can have up to four different combinations. So you could have zero on the two, zero on the three, a zero and a one, a one there and a zero there, and a one and a one. And from each one of those combinations, it will actually set one of these outputs, the Qs, to low. Not high as you might think, the 
Bar across means that they're active low. So if you, if for example, a zero on on A zero there and a zero on A one there selects number four, it means that will, it means that will be low, and five, six, and seven will be high. That's just how it works because these chips are really designed to work with address decoding, particularly in old micros from the eighties and things like that. Um, if you look on here, it has one here. It has, has a not the bar across a not enable. It means to enable this chip to do anything. Number one has to be pulled low. Otherwise, all these outputs four, five, six, and seven will be high. No matter what's happened on these addresses, they will be high. No matter what, unless that's pulled low. If it's high, it's this chip's not enabled. And then, and most chips, whether it's memory chips, whatever it might be, RAM, EEPROM. Their enables are usually always pulled low to enable them. So it made sense as this is basically a memory decoder, it's what they're really designed for, then it will pull these low. But we're not gonna use it quite like that. But first of all, to get it up, we need a voltage on VCC, a ground on eight, and because this is always gonna be enabled, this chip, we always want this chip to be doing something, we're gonna permanently tie the enable to low. So as we talked about these two addresses, determine what value will come out on there. So if enable was high, as we mentioned, nothing would come out on there. They'd all be high if enable's high, but enable we're gonna to set to low. And no matter what we put on those addresses, we we'll make no difference to those outputs if enable's high. So we set it low, and if, if both address zero and address one are low, then that first output will be low and all the rest will be high. Let's create a truth table. A tree table is just a, an easy way of uh, looking at the binary options that we've got, the total binary options that we've got. So let's put the first line in. So, as we said, if A1 is low and A0 is low, then Q0, as we can see there, will be low and the rest will be high. Let's look at the other combination. If A1 is low, A0 is high, then it will be Q1 will be low and the rest of those will be high. As I said, it's an active low. It sets low the one that you've got selected from these combinations. And as you can see, we've got four rows because there's only a maximum of four different combinations you can have with two binary digits with A0 or A1. There are no more. So what if we have one and A1, zero and A0, then it will be Q2 that is low and the rest that are high. And the last column would have high there, and a high for A0, our last combination we can have. And in that uh, situation, Q3 will be the one that's pulled low and the rest will be high. Now something interesting is happening. Let's have a look when A1 is low. So there's two conditions when it's low, which are there. If you look at the output Q0, it actually mirrors the input on A0. So if A0 is, as long as A1's pulled low, A0 will be, basically, whatever's on A0 will come out on Q0. It reflects it. Just changing, keeping A1 low and toggling A0 will actually toggle Q0 in exactly the same way as A0. That could be our clock. We want our clock to go in and we want it to come out somewhere. So in this sense, in this scenario, if we have our R squared C clock, it will come out on Q0 as long as we're pulling A1 down and we use A0 as the clock input. Now, let's look at when A1 is 1. So if we set A1 to 1, then Q2 actually mirrors A0 this time. So this time it's Q2 that's mirroring A0 if A1 is high. So it appears now, looks like, there's no direct sort of electrical connection, it looks like our clock is coming out on Q2 now. And if you look at Q0, it's just permanently held high. We've got no clock on there whatsoever. And the previous scenario, when A1 was pulled low, Q2 was permanently pulled out, there was no clock on there. But when we set A1 to 1, the, whatever goes in on A0 is reflected on Q2. So we can say that A0 basically is going to be our clock in from our, our, our squared C and that to select which day the display is going to get that clock we can use A1 as a display connect, connect as a display select line connect that to a pin on the Arduino and we toggle it low or high and we can select which display 
get to that clock if we connect one of the displays to Q0. So we connect one clock of one display to Q0 and we connect the other clock of the other display to Q2. These outputs and inputs on this side are just a complete another set of a, multi of a demultiplexer and we're not going to use them. You, you could if your project could make use of them but for our own purposes they're just dead weight, they're just spare, we're not going to use them. So you can see what we need now basically is to have our data line permanently connected to both displays and it doesn't matter what's on there if one of the displays doesn't have a clock it can't do anything with that data, it's effectively ignored. So by switching the clock between displays, we can actually make them listen or not listen to the data on the data line. So the data line will be common all the way to each display. And the clock is the one we're going to switch just by toggling a single output on our Arduino. We can actually choose which display we want. So let's go back to the hardware and see it in action. So, okay, here's the actual hardware that we've just uh, seen the diagram for. As you can see, we've got our 139 chip in there, our two displays, and our Arduino. If you look how we connected it up, we've got, uh, obviously, power there, going to VCC and grain going into the bottom connection. We've got it, if you remember, the enable pin, or the not enable pin, being asked to be pull low to enable this chip, is pull low there. Note that you don't need pull-up resistors with 74 series logic. You can just connect them to high or low for whatever inputs without any problems whatsoever. They have very high resistance inputs and they also cannot deliver a lot of power as well. You can't just connect LEDs to these and expect them to light them up. They, you're going to damage them. But you can connect them straight to the power as you need. So I'll pull that low. And then we had our select going into A1. So this is our select going off the A3 line on the Arduino there and it goes into basically address one in there so we can toggle that high and low depending on which display you're going to receive the clock. Um, before we talk about the clock we've got the data, see the data's coming out on here, I always use blue for data if I can and it goes into the data of this screen and it's just connected up there again and going into the data of that. So they're both connected to the data at the same time, it's not a problem because unless they're seeing a clock they can't do anything or even really see that data at all. So the clock comes out of the Arduino into A0 and then depending, as we saw on that truth table, depending on which one, which way this is toggled, if it's low, if this is low, then this clock going in does not get sort of like mapped through and come out here. It's just a, a function of the logic. As this goes low, that would go low. As this goes, this clock goes high, that would go high. So effectively, it is kind of coming out on, on that pin there, which is pin 1, 2, 3, 4, pin 4. So if we, as long as we set that to 0, then whatever's going on here with this clock will be reflected here. So it's effectively the clock gets put into that one. When that goes high, then this stays high. And so this clock is not effective anymore. There's no clock there. And whatever's happening here is then routed to this pin, pin 6, and that then goes there. So if this is high, basically the clock goes through along there. If this is low, basically the clock goes through along there. And that's how we select our different screens. Let's power it up and have a look. And the right way would be good. There we go. And there we go, and off we go. You can see that when we looked at the code earlier, we've got a line going up and down and a line going backwards and forwards. And that is it. The actual fault that I had on the using the um, official sort of really posh R squared C multiplexer that we had on the last video where I had, I had a problem where if you powered it up, it just wouldn't work unless you pre few presses of the, the reset button on the Arduino, like a soft reset. It wouldn't work from power up. Uh, but I figured that out while I was working on this. I know exactly what I've done wrong. I haven't tested it, but I do know exactly what I've done wrong because I encountered a similar issue with this circuit and then I realised what I'd done. So I'm not going to reveal that now. I'll do another short video uh, with this rewired up with the official one. Because the official one can be very handy if you want to support more than one screen. This will only support, doing it this way with this 74 series logic, will only support two screens. Or maybe if you use the other connections as well, perhaps four. But not as many as potentially as the other one can do. These are really cheap though. I can't remember exactly what I paid for it. But I think I got about ten of these for about a pound for another idea I had, which um, I've not done now. So, and I think the... The actual R squared, D deco R squared decoder was at least a pound just for one or thereabouts or a dollar or thereabouts. 
It was about 10 times more expensive than one of these. So depending on what your project needs are, and the fact this actually takes up a smaller footprint as well, one of these might be a better option compared to using one of the official sort of multiplexers. And it's a nice bit of 80s technology. I think these were probably designed somewhere in the late 70s, mid to late 70s. Uh, but with the booming home micros in the 80s, you'd see these on most motherboards of the very early micros doing some address decoding. So you can select different uh, peripherals quite often or different aspects of your computer to operate. So let's have a quick look at the code. It's the same code as I had in the uh, previous video. We set the device select pin, it's going to select, oh, what did I do there? We select the device select pin, the one that's going to choose which display, to A3, one of the analog inputs. On the Arduinos, you can use the analog inputs, uh, the analog pins for input output if you want to. I'm going to in this case, only for the pure reason it keeps all my wires on one side of the Arduino Nano and it looks neater than having one on the other side. No other reason than that. So we're going to select our uh, select pin to select the display as A3. So when that's zero, one display will be getting the clock. When it's a one, the other display will be getting the clock. And so we can send data to either one. So we quickly set its uh, pin mode there. There we go, that's it. And if you look, what we're doing, I'm not doing very well there, am I? And if you look on this line here, we are selecting it, uh, setting it high. So one of the displays is going to be getting the clock now, and we send an initialization, initialization, an initialization routine, which is taken care of by the Adafruit uh, code there. That will initialize that screen, and then we'll set it to low. So the other screen is selected for the clock, and then we'll send that same initialize again. Otherwise, the screens won't work correctly. Then we go into the main loop. We clear the display. We write the line that we're going to. This is going to be the horizontal line coming down. We select device zero, and then we display that line. We then clear display. I mentioned this in the last video. It's not going to actually clear display on that device we've just written to. It's actually an internal memory thing. So we're clearing the internal memory. Nothing's actually sent to this, the screens until you send that command there. So we're clearing the internal memory there. Then we write our vertical line, it's going to go across. Then we say, we're going to use the other screen, setting that pin to high. And then we display that vertical line. And then we do some gubbins just to move the line and make sure we check the edges and reverse the direction, whatever we're doing. And then we repeat over and over again. It goes backwards and forwards, up and down, and it writes each screen separately. So that's it for now. Like, subscribe. Channel's been going great. Really appreciate those likes. Well, thanks a lot, and I'll see you next time.